So if we measure distances in astronomy, we could use meters. I mean, it's just 10 to the lots. But we have a unit that means more, okay? So we have something called a light year. That is the distance uh, light travels in one year. So that's why hopefully it makes sense. Uh, the problem is year almost implies a time. So you gotta be very careful. We use LY for the short form here. So LY is a light year. And we have one light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. You don't have to memorize this. This is on your data book. Okay, this is there. You don't have to memorize it. So one light year is 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters. We have another unit we use called parsec. Um, if you've ever seen the original Star Wars movies, this is when Han Solo, there's a scene in the original Star Wars movie where Han Solo, he's um, wanting to take people on the Millennium Falcon. That's his name of his uh, ship. Someone says, is it fast? And he goes, is it fast? You know, this is the ship that did the Kessel run in under 12 parsecs. Now Kessel, it's all made up, right? But he implies 12 parsecs is a time, right? He says it's the ship that made the Kessel run in under 12 parsecs. Now, nerd physicists like me, uh, we take this and we say, hey, what the heck? 12 parsec, that's not a unit of time, it's a unit of distance, ugh. So what is it really? A parsec is just another unit of uh, measurement. It's just uh, 3.26 light years. Okay, so you can always convert things if you need to. Um, it's actually, what would it be? It would be the distance that corresponds to a parallax angle of one arc second. That's why we actually have the word parallax angle and second. So that's actually, you're gonna see later on, that's why we call it that. But this is the unit, you can always convert. Now, let's do an exam question kind of thing. Oh no, not yet, wait, we have an astronomical unit. By the way, when I saw this, I know it's a bit naughty, but look at the name of this ship. I, all, I hope it's real. It's called Titan Uranus. <laughs> like Titan Uranus. <laughs> and it's astronomy related, right? Because Titan is one of Saturn's moons. And Uranus is uh, one of the planets around our uh, solar system. So Titan Uranus. <laughs> oh, okay. So we have a unit called astronomical unit. And that actually is the distance. Now it's the average distance uh, from the Earth to the Sun. Now... It's not exact because if you think about it, this so here is the sun and we have the earth going around it. It's actually in an elliptical orbit, okay? So it's not exactly, right? But we see it's the average distance from the earth to the sun will be called one AU, one astronomical unit. And one astronomical unit is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. So again, you don't have to memorize this, you look it up. In order to find the distance to stars, it's not so simple. You actually have to uh, measure things in really strange or really interesting ways. Uh, first of all, I love this picture here. I love you, I love you too. Oh, kiss me, and then everybody dies. Uh, okay, so let's talk about distances to stars. There's a number of methods of doing it. And because you can't go out and you know measure it yourself, you have to use some other proxy ways. Um, and the most accurate one is the parallax method. I mean, you experience parallax every day, right? I mean, your eyes themselves are really nice sort of parallax machines, assuming you have two that work. Um, you can see depth, can't you? Uh, you ever seen this little trick, for example, you hold out your thumb, for example, and then you open your, uh, close one eye, open one eye, and then it'll put your thumb in front of something that's sort of in the distance, like maybe like a doorknob or something like that, and then try to switch which eye is open. Um, and you'll see that your thumb appears to move. Obviously it doesn't. That's just because there's a difference in what your left eye sees and what your right eye sees. What happens is your brain is so amazing at this, when it notices the difference, it says, oh, that's close. Whereas if your thumb was really, really far away, for example, um, then you wouldn't see so much difference in this. So uh, this, this allows you to see depth. Well, we can use this for stars as well, because what we can do is, if we can see, basically the idea is to use the same sort of concept as like with your eyes, right? And it turns out the further out your eyes are, so to speak, um, the better depth perception you'll have. But it necessitates that this, this thing, like I had my thumb, for example, it has to be in the foreground, has to be you know closer than the background that you can compare it with. So the parallax method uses that sort of idea. The idea was that the stars themselves are so far away that maybe there's a close one and it acts kind of like our thumb would in that sense. Where, you know, if we can sort of take a picture and then take a picture and if we see it move with respect to the background, then we can say, aha, we know it's distance because we can use some trigonometry. The problem, of course, is that when we tried that, you know, with like a, two different telescopes a few meters apart or whatever, we don't see any difference. 
And that's because stars are so far away, the angles get so, so small, they're almost impossible to detect. Uh, so this is the way it works here. Yeah, so let me show you something. Um, so let's just assume there's a whole bunch of like a, a background stars. Okay, so I'll just draw a whole bunch of stars in the background. There we go. And then what we do is we try to make our eyes, so to speak, the farthest apart they could be. Now you think, uh, maybe I can put a telescope on one end of the Earth and one on the other end, but even that's not enough. But luckily we're clever about this, right? So here's what we do. We take, you know, for example, here's the sun. And if this, here's the Earth. Now the Earth goes in orbit, of course, around the sun. What we do is we take an image, let's say, um, on June 1st, let's just say, we take an image here of some star. Now the important thing is gonna be that we look at a, a background star, it has to be compared to something else. So let's just say we're looking at um, this particular star right here, this one right here. If we're looking at it though, it's going to appear, whoops, sort of, whoops, I did a really bad job drawing there. Maybe I should use a little ruler thingy here. There we go. So for example, we can draw something like this right here. And then we can draw something like this. What happens is six months later, when the Earth goes you know, halfway around its orbit, we can take another picture. And we look at that particular, you know, we just look at the night sky there. And so what we would do, of course, we would see that picture uh, six months later, and it would look like, let's see here, something like this. Now what this really means is this, like what's really going on? I mean, we actually take a picture here. What we're going to see is we will observe that this star looks like it moves. That's because notice the background stars will all be the same. You know, the background stars would look the same. Like imagine I'm looking at a little window here. Here's what it would look like. I would actually see these background stars. Let's say one, two, I put one over here, one over here. Maybe in the picture on one day, uh, maybe I'll color code these actually. Just wait, watch, I'll do something a little bit better. What I'll do, I'll color code them. I'll make this one uh, sort of this purplish color like this. So what I can do then is say, all right, so uh, when I took this picture at this time right here, do you notice that this star then will appear somewhere in this line right here? In other words, it'll appear maybe here. Do you see that? Like, you know, if you look at it compared to the other stars. Whereas on another day, let's say those six months earlier, because I want to take that picture. Do you notice it was sort of lined up with these ones? So it'll be sort of like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll see it like right here. Do you notice then, or maybe I'll uh, erase that, maybe I'll put it in between them like this, something like that. You know, it'll appear somewhere over there, or it'll appear somewhere over there. Uh, so the interesting thing is that, I mean, it's not exactly drawn that way. This right here would be in front, but something like this. Do you notice that this one here is moving? It appears to move compared to the background stars. So what's really going on is because this star is closer, it's a lot closer compared to the background, that we actually are seeing it sort of appear to move like your thumb did. It turns out through some clever geometry, what we can do is say, all right, well, um, if we can take sort of a straight line right here, because of course we can measure this angle. Turns out we can measure that angle theta here, uh, just like we can measure, oops, but I'm really bad at drawing straight lines in freehand, that's for sure. That's an angle right there. Because of that, we can actually use some geometry right here. And if we make this right here, whoops, make this here a straight line going down and going across like this, we can do a bit of trigonometry. You ever heard of this sort of Z trig of the two parallel lines, this one and this one, this angle right here will be the same as that angle there. So because I can measure the angle that I can actually see it at, I can then get that angle there. And it turns out you can use tangent because tangent is opposite this right here is one astronomical unit, the distance from Earth to the Sun. This right here would be the distance then, this right here. Turns out you could do a tangent is one over D, but it turns out at very, very, very small angles. I mean, if the angle is really, really small, um, at sufficiently small angles, tan of theta is just theta. So that's why we can actually use this equation right here. So in other words, tan of theta is just pretty much theta. So then you can say then that this angle um, is equal to just one over D. Conversely, d is equal to 1 over the angle. Now this angle, instead of calling it theta, they call it p instead. That's all. So this right here would be actually p, the parallax angle. So we can define then the distance to a star by using this. The distance to a star, and we have something called a parallax angle. Now what's important is to know the units that we use for this. The parallax angle, we don't use meters for it. We use parsec. Uh, it turns out there's going to be a reason for it. A second here. And distance to the star, that'll be, oh God, what did I do? 
The parallax angle isn't parsec. The parallax angle is an arc seconds. I don't know what I was thinking there. There, it's an arc seconds. I'll explain that. What happens is if you take um, a whole entire sphere and you split it up into degrees, that'll be 360 even parts, right? You have 360 degrees in a circle. So imagine you take a whole circle, you split it up into 360 small pieces. Now, those, these angles are so small, even a degree isn't enough. So you can split up each degree into 60 even pieces. We call those minutes of arc or arc minutes. But even that's too big. So you take each of those 60ths of a degree and you split it up into 60 even pieces and that's called an arc second. So one arc second is one 3,600th of a degree, which is crazy small. And those are the angles we measure. We measure actually like a decimal, like a point oh something, like 0.03 arc seconds or something like that. So the distances to stars, they're actually measured in a unit we call parsec. And the reason we call it a parsec, if you think about it, if we define this right here, what if we made P1? Then D would be 1. Do you see that? And it turns out that's what 1 parsec is. 1 parsec is the distance uh, with the parallax angle of 1 arc second. That's why we call it a parsec, because the distance for 1 parallax angle, let's put it like this here, watch. This is for a parallax angle of one second. So if we have a parallax angle of one arc second, uh, then we call that one parsec. And again, one parsec is 3.26 light years. This is a great method of finding distances. It's geometric, which means you know, it works really well. It's very accurate. The problem is it only works for close things. If it's too far away, we're not going to see it. You see that? We won't really see that parallax angle changing. So that's why it's useful for close things. It's very accurate. It's, the, it's probably the most accurate one we have. But it only works for relatively close things. Um, and at least at the time that I record this, this is fairly new. This is a, um, they're doing big searches uh, for exoplanets. These are planets around other stars. What we can do is we can watch the stars really carefully without blinking, basically. Um, one of the telescopes used was called Kepler. That's one that we put into space. It follows the Earth uh, around an orbit around the sun. And it was staring at a few hundred thousand stars without ever blinking, just sort of watching them. What we do is we hope that a planet passes in front of the star. It's called a transit. And if it passes in front of the star, we hope to see the star's light dim a little bit. And it'd be periodic. Turns out if you can see three or four of these things happening, then you can determine it wasn't just a weird thing in the star. It's actually a planet. So this is one famous one, at least at the time that I record these, um, called TRAPPIST-1. Now we know it's a red dwarf, which means it's a tiny little red star. That means it can be really old, it'll last kind of forever, but it has seven planets already orbiting it. So we've already detected seven at the time that I record this. Now the star has a parallax angle of 0.08 arc seconds. So the question is, how long would it take for radio signals sent from Earth to reach one of the planets. In other words, what if there's an alien sitting on one of those planets? How long would it take for us to basically say, hello? Obviously that part we don't know. We know that there's planets, that's all we know. We don't know that there's aliens on there, right? But let's just take it a little step further and have some fun. But this is, so this is its parallax angle. So what we can do then is we can just use this really simple idea about parallax angle. Remember that from back here? If we can find the parallax angle, we can find the distance. So D is one over P where the parallax angle has to be in arc seconds and the distance is in parsecs. And remember there's 3.26 light years in a parsec. These are on your data booklets, so you don't have to memorize them. So if we do that, then we can just say, ah, it's really easy then. I hope you can see that. Let's write down the equation that we use. So D is one over P. Um, therefore, the distance is gonna be one over the parallax angle, which is 0 0.08. Well, let me just do that on my trusted calculator, one over 0 0.08. I get an answer of 12.5. What are the units though, do you remember? It's measured in parsec. Now the problem is that doesn't answer my question. Maybe I can convert this to light years instead. So it turns out, remember if I got parsecs on the top, I want parsec on the bottom to cancel them out. And I know a conversion. I know that there are 3.26 light years for every one parsec. If I do it like this, that means I'll multiply and I'll get my answer in light years. So I do this answer times 3.26, and I end up with 40.75 light years away. Now, this was a slightly different 
type of question, but it's still related to this because how long would it take for a radio signal? Radio signal is light. And if this is a distance of 40, let's just say, or 41, let's say, light years away, what it means is that it'll take light 41 years to get there, which means that's actually our answer. It turns out the time then would be 41 years. Because if it's 41 light years away, radio signals are just light, it'll take light literally 41 years to get there. So this is answering that question. So that means if we want to talk to any aliens that may be living on one of those planets around TRAPPIST-1, it'll take us 41 years to send out signals. In other words, we can say like, hello, how are you doing? And we have to wait 41 years for them to receive it. And assuming they receive it and there's aliens there who feel like talking to us, they could send us back a signal say, fine, how are you? They see that it'll be a really long time. So if nothing else, it'll be slow if there's anybody there. So trust me, we're watching and listening uh, around those different exoplanet uh, stars. So TRAPPIST-1 is a really interesting one to look at. But I hope that explains that you, know, you can still do really interesting uh, astrophysics, but still related to IB questions.